Hello, everyone, and welcome to the May presentation from Relo Andes webinars. For those of you who are not familiar with Relo Andes, Relo is the Regional English Language Office. We are based out of the U.S. Embassy in Lima, Peru. The Relo Office is in charge of all things having to do with English language programming for Relo Andes in Spanish-speaking South America. My name is Maggie Steingraber. I am English in Peru. Host and coordinate the questions that you have, answers you may have had, you will probably hear from me. So feel free to write me or send me messages through the email that you received. So the webinar software that we are using, I'm sure you received an email, is called Citrix GoToWebinar. For those of you, we will go to today's presenter. Today's presenter is Kayla. She is a English language fellow based in Panama. Kayla, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Hey, Maggie. Great. Welcome. Are you ready for your presentation? I am. Thank you. Good afternoon, guys. I'm happy to have you all here, and I want to tell you a little bit about myself first before we get started on the multi-level language classroom. Um, like Maggie said, my name is Kayla Dievenberg, um, and I am working as an English language fellow um, for the embassy in Panama, and I'm working specifically with an organization called Panama Bilingue. Um, and I've been here for about nine months now, and I've been working with teachers all over the country, and specifically in the, the middle of the country here where, where I live in Santiago, and uh, with future teachers and with in-service teachers. My background is in um, teaching English at, at the university level. I'm from Florida, and I teach at the University of North Florida in an intensive English program. And the reason that I wrote this, this webinar is because I have a lot of experience with teaching learners of multiple levels in the same classroom. And it's a, a challenge that I see teachers facing everywhere I go. When I first started teaching 15 or 16 years ago, the program at the University of North Florida was tiny, and the classes there were grouped with two levels of students in each class. So we would have like a, a level 1A and a level 1B. And we worked that way with two different groups for, for several years before we had enough students that we could have a teacher assigned to each level. And then here in Panama, I see similar situations happening. And I think in just about all of our schools, we see, we see that kind of thing. So it's tricky to teach learners of multiple levels all together. But I think there are some ways to make it really positive for the teacher and the student. So we're going to talk about that today. So I like to show a few pictures of what I've been doing lately. This is me at the top left is me in a classroom with some students practicing pronunciation here in Panama. The top right is one of my groups back from Florida at the end of the semester. So you can see they're a diverse group from all over. The bottom left is a, a presentation on pronunciation that I did for some coordinators in the country. Us at the canal and then me with a, a fellow teacher here at the school. So. I want to hear a little bit about your experience. Um, so we're going to take the first poll. So Maggie is going to have you um, write in, in the poll, answer, about whether or not you have struggled with students at different levels. So. In your classes, do you notice that you have students at different levels, or are you in a program that kind of requires that, or are most of the students in your class generally at the, at the same level? So I've noticed this happening, like I mentioned, in programs where they have fewer teachers than levels. So sometimes it's just the way the program is designed, and they have students at many different levels, but they only have half the number of teachers, for example. 
in some programs, like this, the high school where I'm, I'm currently working, the students progress by grade. And because students learn at different rates, we have some more advanced students and some much more basic level proficiency students in the same classes. Also, in multi-grade classrooms, in Panama, it's really common for schools in remote areas to have maybe just two classes. So they have kindergarten, first, and second grade in the same room. And so that presents its own challenges. And then I think no matter how well the program tests its, stu its students and groups its students into classes, we still have discrepancies within classes. So um, let's hear from you guys. So 27% okay. of people said that all of their students are basically the same level and 73% of people have some students at a higher lower level than others. Okay, okay, great. So that's kind of what I was expecting. I think if you have faced this challenge of having students at different levels, you were probably attracted to this webinar. And if your current students are all pretty much at the same level, then hopefully you can gain some tips today for future classes that you might have. So for those of you who are teaching or have taught groups where there are multiple levels in the same room working together, I would like you to tell me a little bit about the challenges that you face or that you have faced in that situation. So I have a list here that I'm going to go through, but in the meantime, will you type into the chat box a short phrase about one or two of the challenges that you found in teaching learners of different levels. So these are some of the ones that I've seen or experienced. So of course meeting the needs of all the groups. So it's really hard to make sure that we're giving enough attention to this group but also to the other group. Our students are individual so when we have multiple groups that we're focused on, it's easy to forget or to feel like we're neglecting their individual needs. So that's a big challenge. We need to meet course objectives. So we have to think about what we're trying to accomplish in that course or those courses, but also meeting the students' needs. Distraction while working. So if we've got a lot going on in the room with different groups, it's easy for the students to start working on something else or not working at all or paying attention to what the teacher is doing instead of what they've been assigned. They might fall into using their native language. There's always that experience when you're working with a group and behind you you can hear all the, the other students saying, teacher, teacher, or I'm finished, I'm finished. And, and they all seem to need you when you're working with a different group. You might have two or more textbooks or curriculum. Depending on who, what types of groups you're working with, you may or may not have the same materials to cover with them. And you might have varying ages of students depending on the situation too. So all of this adds up to what can be seen as kind of overwhelming lesson planning. And so today I want to talk about some ways that you can approach it and maybe feel a little bit more in control and hopefully simplify it a bit. So Maggie, can you share any um, responses from the chat box about challenges that teachers here face? Uh, we have Amelia who says uh, students who get bored. So I guess paying attention with things. Yeah, uh, for sure. Speaking Spanish uh -huh. in the classroom. What's that? Uh, large classrooms. The curriculum from Gabriela says that. Mm -hmm. Again, use of first language among students is another one. The students getting bored from Sirle. Okay. Yeah, so these, I think these are all issues that we can face in just about any type of classroom. So. We'll cover some strategies and then at the end if you still have questions for specific cases of ways to handle uh, more than one group in your class, then we can talk about those too. So let's move on and talk about the other side of this. So there are challenges but there are also advantages 
So have you ever thought about how this can be an advantage for students? So let's put a positive spin on it and think about how students can develop re responsibility for their own learning. So we're asking a lot of our students. We have high expectations for them that they sometimes don't meet. But when we support them in the right way, they can meet those expectations and they develop this sense of responsibility for their own learning, which is going to be much more valuable than us just giving them everything. They become more independent learners, so that's related to developing some responsibility. They don't depend so much on the teacher. They can learn at their own pace. So like we said before, everybody acquires language at their own rate. So they have a little bit more flexibility if there are multiple groups in the room. They learn well to work well in a group. So this is a life skill, right? We, we need to work with others. And the sooner we learn how to do this and depending on each other and using strengths and weaknesses within a group to move forward, the better off we are in, in acquiring that skill for life. Uh, they develop strong relationships with their peers. So some of these groups it can become very tight-knit. They become partners in learning, so they might motivate each other. They, sometimes students do a better job of helping each other even than, than the teacher can do. And finally, they mo motivate each other to work and learn. Then on the other side of it, for the teacher, what are the advantages? Have you guys thought about that? So I think the most impressive advantage is that it challenges us to be creative and it increases our teaching skills. So if you think about your experience after teaching a very diverse group of learners, if you have a class that's more similar in level or proficiency, it seems like a piece of cake, right? It will seem super simple. So I think having a mixed level class really challenges us and helps us to reach into our toolkit and find the best way to deal with these challenges. All right, so I like to start off by thinking about students' goals, programs' goals, teachers' goals, so that we can focus on the right thing. Sometimes we teachers can get lost in the textbook or something else, wanting to do what the students are asking for. And we kind of need to take a step back and think about what the goal of the course is or what the students' goals are and help them tap into those. So usually the program's goal is not finishing a textbook, right? It's meeting certain objectives. It's the students progressing towards some goal, some acquiring a specific list of skills. Um, and our goals as teachers are usually to help the students meet these goals. And then often students have individual goals that we want to help them meet. So as you're planning classes, I think it's helpful to keep all of this in mind and even keep it written down, what your goals are, what the main objective of the program is, so that you don't lose sight of that and focus on, on the difficulty. Think of the ways that you can use, work with the challenges to work towards these targets. So our objectives today is, are to reach these goals, help students, help teachers provide classes that meet their program's goals, and help teachers better manage how they're planning so that we don't feel so overwhelmed when we have these very diverse groups of learners. So we're going to focus today on three key strategies. The first one is increasing learner autonomy. Next, dividing and combining students. So we're going to talk about grouping. And then finally, planning and preparing materials, locating and, and using different materials in a, in a class like this. So first, let's talk about encouraging learner autonomy. So when we want our students to work on their own. Sometimes we have expectations that they already know how to do just that, that they already know how to be independent. I think because we as teachers are usually very independent people. And with some teaching experience, we also see that 
some students can be very independent, but being an autonomous and independent learner is something that takes some practice, it takes some support, um, and it takes, you know, preparation from, from a teacher. So let's talk a little bit about guided release of responsibility. So before we expect our students to be able to do anything on their own or in a group without our immediate assistance, we really have to provide them with the tools to get there. So you guys may use this, I do it, we do it, you do it together, and you do it alone model. So a lot of times we're presenting the material first and then we're modeling it with the students, and then we are asking them to do it in small groups while we walk around and we monitor how they're doing, we give them feedback, and then finally we're asking them to do it alone. So we don't want to jump from, here's the material, okay, go work on it by yourself. Instead, we need to take these gradual steps of releasing the responsibility from teacher to students with plenty of support. So, for example, this might be the way a quick conversation might go in, in a class with some extra examples in between with teacher practice. So the I do it stage, the teacher might say, what did you do last weekend? And I might answer as the teacher, I watched TV, I cooked for my friends, I did my laundry. So this is just the teacher speaking. Then when we say we do it, the teacher is engaging the students, getting the students involved. The whole class is working together. So as the teacher, I say, Sandra, what did you do last weekend? And Sandra, the student, replies, I played soccer and I went to the movies. So we're modeling this for the class just like I modeled it alone as teacher and student in the I do it stage. Then the students work with a partner or in small groups and they're asking the same question. They may ask it multiple times to different people and that gives you as the teacher the opportunity to listen to them to see where they need more support and whether or not they're ready for something more independent which might be a writing assignment or something else that, that requires more um, auton autonomous work. All right, so some other ways to engage uh, students as independent learners. We need to provide scaffolding. We're gonna talk about that more in a minute. Pre-teaching vocabulary and pronunciation. Teaching study skills. Checking comprehension. Encouraging reliance on peers. And providing a schedule of tasks. So let's talk about each one of these in a little bit more depth. So scaffolding, what forms of scaffolding do you use to support your students? So remember scaffolding is any way that you take the material that you're presenting to your students and you raise your students up in some way to support them to be able to work with that material when they need that extra support. So it may be giving them synonyms for new vocabulary. It may be speaking slowly. These are some examples. So can I ask you guys, participants, to type in some of the ways that you provide scaffolding for your students? What do you do specifically to support students in your class when they need extra help? So I'm going to go ahead and show some of the ideas in this list for scaffolding and then I'd like to hear others that you guys use or you can um, type any off the list if they are favorites of yours. So speaking slowly, if you have Spanish speakers you have a huge advantage because you can use a lot of cognates in English, um, you can use antonyms, you can gesture, you can move around a lot. I always say I don't speak another language in the class, but I do a lot of pointing and a lot of dramatizing. You can give examples. 
You can ask comprehension questions so that students can answer and reinforce ideas that somebody else may have missed. Of course, we use tons of pictures, right? So what do you guys use? Maggie, can you share some of the... Yeah, so we have Amelia says that she uses uh, sets of cards for verbs. Okay. Uh, Gabriela likes to use their prior knowledge and complement what they're doing in the class. Excellent. Uh, more again with pictures in the class. Uh, Gabriela also has charades. Orlando's has a lot of body language. Again, flashcards. Looks like mm -hmm. a lot of flashcards. Uh, let's see, what else? Yeah. Flashcards again, body language, prior knowledge, Excellent. pictures. Excellent. So this support is really, really, really important especially when we're working with groups who might need to be working more independently because we're teaching them how to scaffold for themselves and for each other also. So you're modeling ways that they can help each other, they can give each other synonyms, they can speak slowly for each other. Um, and anytime you're doing it in a multi-level class, you're teaching them what they could do for each other too. Great, thanks for your answers. All right. So in pre-teaching vocabulary, I think this is something that we always ask, let students ask us questions about vocabulary, but when we're working, when we're giving them more, um, more time to work independently from the teacher, it's really important that they have these opportunities to feel like they are not overwhelmed by new vocabulary. So we can give them some some tools before we send them off on their own so that they feel comfortable with what they're learning um, and that they're able to, to make sense of it enough that they're not overwhelmed and feeling like they really need the teacher there with them. So you can anticipate the needs of your students. If you know your students well or you have an idea of what their level is, you can look at a reading or listen to a conversation and pick out any vocabulary that you think they, they might need before they listen or they read. So model the pronunciation because the worst thing is when students come across a new word and they're sitting there in a group without the teacher and they keep saying the word incorrectly because they've never seen it before. So give them the correct pronunciation, let them repeat it after you so that they are reinforcing the correct pronunciation as they're working in a group away from you. Then, of course, they can come back to you and ask questions about vocabulary or pronunciation that you didn't anticipate, but it's great to give them what you, what you can foresee before they get started. Study skills. I think this, it really depends on the student's background, their age, what kind of um, habits they've developed on their own. But autonomous learners really need to develop some skills on their own for, for acquiring language. They can't just expect to sit in a class and have everything given to them. So some students don't have great note-taking habits. Um, in Panama, there's a really strong note-taking culture. So every student has a, has a notebook and writes things down really well, um, really consistently. But um, teaching in the U.S., I know that's not the case for, for even American students. We, we're not the best at writing things down. And um, so that's a skill that teachers can help their students learn for themselves. Learning to use a dictionary. So a lot of times students are saying, teacher, what does this mean? Teacher, what does this mean? When they have the tools to look it up themselves. So it's a habit that we can create in our students. And then asking appropriate questions. And by appropriate questions, I mean sometimes students will sit and, and be quiet because they think it's um, not appropriate to ask the teacher a question. So let the students know what kinds of things are perfectly okay to ask. How do you pronounce this? What does this mean? Can you repeat that? Um, and then also we need to teach them when to ask questions. So maybe not in the middle of while you're working with another group. Okay, so let's review some and I'll add a little bit to 
the last few points. So we talked about scaffolding, vocabulary, study skills, checking comprehension. So anytime we're giving students directions to get started on something, we need to make sure that they know what they have to do. So my students laugh at me because I often say, okay, please go and do this. Okay, and immediately after that I say, now what are you going to do? And they kind of repeat it back to me sarcastically. But at least I know that they know what they're, what they're headed out to do. And uh, re encourage reliance on peers. So we want to minimize that teacher, teacher, teacher when we're working with another group and help them rely on each other because a lot of times their, their fellow students have the answers. Another teacher here in Panama said she, says she teaches her students the phrase, ask three before me. So that means if you have a question about homework or an assignment or a vocabulary word, you need to ask three people in the class before you go to the teacher. And I think most of the time you will, students will find that they get their answer from the first student they ask and they never make it to the teacher. So I thought that was great advice and I said, I'm going to use that with my kids too. They need to, they need to rely on each other before they come to me. And then finally, provide a schedule of tasks. So we're going to talk about that a little bit later in the planning portion. All right, so moving on from learner autonomy, we are going to talk about dividing and combining groups uh, and classes. So we're going to take the next poll. Please tell me how your students in your classes spend the majority of their time. So you're just going to choose one in the poll because we're talking about the majority of their class time. Whole class all together, divided into two groups, or maybe three large groups, small groups, so three, four, or five students, or in pairs. How do they spend the majority of their time? We'll share the results. So we have 22% say as a whole group, 4% in two or three large groups, 43% in small groups, and 30% in pairs. Okay, great. So a little bit of everything, and I think that's perfect because we want to use a variety of groupings. We want to have some whole class work simplifies things for the teacher, but also it lets students interact in a different way. But then we also want to divide a lot so that we have more students talking at the same time and giving them plenty of opportunities to, to practice what they're learning. So how about grouping? This is another poll. So when you're grouping your students, and I'm assuming that you are taking control of who is grouped together, or in the cases where you're not letting them get together with their friends, when you're in control of it, what factors do you consider? Age, learning style, their proficiency in the language, and personality or motivation level. So you can choose one or all. Which of, the, which of these do you consider? Share the results. So 27% said age, 19% said learning style, 62% said English proficiency, and 62% said personality motivation level. Okay, great. So I would say we want to consider all of these, and we'll come back and talk about all of them a little bit, but we're going to go most in depth to English proficiency because I think that's the, the factor that's mostly on our mind when we're teaching an English class. But um, I, I want to point out that we should also consider these other factors and that we should experiment. We don't always have to group students in the same ways or with the same criteria. So try, try different things. So when we're talking about English proficiency, we can group them with students who have similar ability level or different ability level than them. So let's first talk about like ability grouping. So these are students who are all at a similar level grouped together. So you might put your lower level students in one group or in two groups, and then on the other side of the room, you're slightly more advanced students together. So what are the advantages? 
Students feel comfortable with their peers. Students can work from the same textbook or materials. But if students, if all the beginner students are grouped together, they may lack skills to answer each other's questions because there's not somebody more advanced there. And if the teacher is busy with another group, they may be kind of on their own. So when can we use this? When we're working on something really level specific, so something that those, only those beginners need, we might put them together. For problem solving, so this might be a, a task where if they had somebody in their group that was more advanced, that more advanced student might end up doing all the work. So if you want them to work through a problem on their own to figure something out, then it might be best to put them with students of a similar ability level. And when we are putting them together without a lot of diversity within the group, we have to give them plenty of scaffolding and guided release of responsibility. So giving them plenty of support before we set them off on their own. So often, when we put them into groups this way, we differentiate instruction. So we may be working from two separate textbooks, but we may also be looking for ways to um, teach something similar in our class and provide some unity in some way. So we're gonna talk about that. So to differentiate instruction means that we are giving different assignments or asking for a different um, outcome from different groups. Um, with the goal being that they're going to achieve something different based on their ability level. So some teachers use this a lot and other teachers prefer to group students, a higher student and a lower level student together and have the whole class work on something similar. But these are different approaches and I encourage you to try to experiment with different ways of grouping students and differentiating instruction within your class. So you can differentiate, you can require students to do within their group. Uh, one group might work with one type of content and another group may work with another type of content. Uh, the lower level with one type, I'll give you some examples in a minute and um, the higher level group with another type of content. You can differentiate the process and also the product. So I'm gonna go through these quickly uh, for, for the sake of time. So for example, this one would be differentiating content. So students in group A, these are our lower level readers, read a simplified article about food additives. And I'm gonna show you a, a great source for uh, differentiating uh, reading. Group B, these might be higher, a little bit higher proficiency, read the original article on the same topic. So this one has the maybe even native level vocabulary in it. The class comes together as a whole group for a debate on food additives. So our end goal is to come together but the content that I'm providing each group is a little bit different because they can each handle a different level of vocabulary, grammar, structures, that, what they're able to, to process. So let's talk about this example. Students in group A and B listen to the same TED Talk. Group A has a discussion and then group B has a discussion. Group A focuses on very explicit facts and details that they heard in the lecture. And group B talks, talks about more uh, in-depth topics. They may be analyzing the main idea, they may be inferring something that the speaker said. So in this case, their process is different. We're using the same content because we're listening to the same talk but then the process that we're using, the things that we're asking of them in the process that they're discussing uh, vary. And then finally, this is another example where the students are learning about classroom objects and group A might just label the items in a picture. They're just using a single noun. While the students in group B are writing sentences using those same objects. 
So you can see that the product here is different, but we are still talking about the same topic. So it's a way to differentiate within your class, but to have some unity so that you're not going crazy jumping from one group to the other. Everybody in the class is still focusing on classroom objects in this case. So I encourage you to read more about differentiating instruction to try using um, some assignments like this. And I'll give you some sources in just a minute. So let's talk about cross-ability grouping. I think we as teachers use this a lot because it's kind of similar to the teacher-student relationship. So we have students work with students on a different level. So in this case, lower level students benefit from their higher level partner's knowledge. The higher level students may gain confidence. The disadvantages might be that the higher level students feel bored or not challenged. The lower level students need extra scaffolding to participate with confidence. So when should we use it? So it really helps if we're reinforcing something with a higher level. We're giving them a lot of responsibility. So we need to make sure that those students are ready for those demands. But then we also need to make sure that the lower, the lower level students have that ability to participate. So we're, we're giving them plenty of support. And we also know that the lower level students are motivated. The, the worst thing is when you have a lower level student who's not motivated and then the higher level student ends up doing all the work. So I jokingly say that, that I often use likeability grouping more often because if the lower level students are together, especially the less motivated ones, if they are together, they often do work that they wouldn't have done if they had had a partner who was going to carry the, the weight for them. So think about how you group students and what you can do to make sure that everybody within the group is working and nobody is uh, you know, riding on the shoulders of their stronger partners. So let's go back uh, to cross-ability grouping just for a minute because cross-ability grouping is really what whole class instruction is too. So this has many merits as far as uh, the teacher's outlook goes because it really simplifies you're planning if you can plan for the entire class to be working on something together. You can give similar feedback. You can monitor them. You don't have to feel like you're running back and forth between two different classes or three different classes. Um, so look for ways that you can instruct um, your groups as a whole class in a creative way so that you're meeting needs of students. Um, based on what you know about them. So be strategic. Think about what kinds of activities you're going to choose. If you're going to do a whole class activity, what's going to work for small groups, what's going to work for pairs, what works best for like and cross-ability grouping, what, what is going to work best with learning styles, with their motivation level, and what will work well for independent work. So be creative. Try different things. A lot of teaching is experimenting and then reflecting on what went well and what you could change the next time to make the groupings go better, to make the activity work better for, for the purpose. So let's talk a little bit about material because everybody likes to find new, new places to source material. So if you're working with like ability groups, you can create info gaps or jigsaw activities that are tiered. So this means that one group is working with uh, an info gap that may have more spaces in it for filling in vocabulary words, while the other group's info gap has fewer spaces in it. So you can create uh, materials that are, that are geared towards the specific level of learning, but um, still on the same topic so that you have some unity in your class. News ELA is a great source for reading. TED Talks, like we talked about with the differentiating instruction example, is a good source for listening where you can use um, the same talk in several different ways. 
And then for cross-ability groups, remember that your goal is not finishing a textbook. So you can look at the scope and sequences pages of the textbook and see what the different levels have in common. Look at the curriculum for different levels if you've got multiple classes together and see what you can accomplish with one activity. So it's not, our goal is never to finish all the pages in the, in the textbook, but our goal is to meet the objectives that those pages were designed for. So think about what activities you might even substitute instead of using the textbook, just to simplify your life. And then my, my favorite uh, class activity source is the, the book Fun with Grammar. So I'm gonna show you guys a couple of examples. This is from newsela.com. So these are level, leveled readings. They come in, let's see, five different levels. So Max refers to the uh, original level of the article. And then they have been adapted to different lexile levels. So 480 is going to be kind of an intermediate level all the way up to a very advanced level of English. So you can see here that I've got the same article on the top and the bottom. The top one is set to 480 and the bottom one is set to 800. So this one starts, there's a new statue people are talking about in New York City. And then this one starts, there's a popular new stat statue in the financial area of New York City. So this would be a great way to challenge one group and then at the end you can put your classes together and have pair your groups together and have them have the, the discussion about the same topic. Fun with Grammar, this is available online also if you Google it. This is from um, the Betty Azar Grammar Series, but all of the principal cuttable activities are there and they are designated low level, intermediate level, advanced level, um, and they're great for working on just about any grammar point with lots of context and real life examples that the students can move around and do. And it really is fun. <laughs> Okay, and then finally, let's talk about creating a class schedule. So as you're doing your planning, of course you're creating a list of activities that you're gonna have your students do. But having a schedule in a multi-level classroom I think is even more important because we need to know as a teacher where we're gonna be at different points in the class. And then providing that to students can really help the students know that they're not going to be forgotten, that even when you're not with them, you're going to come back and answer their questions eventually. And then when you leave the class for the day, you can feel like you accomplished your schedule and that you didn't neglect one group or the other, which I think can happen sometimes if we, if we don't make a really conscious effort. So this is an example of a class schedule that you might have. And what you share with the students might be a, a very simplified version of this. But you can see that I've included me as the blue teacher. And this is where I am at each point in the class. So here as a warm up, I like to start the class as a whole group. And then we'll divide into two different groups. And here I'm working with one group while the other group is working on something that they um, can practice before I get to them. And then I'm kind of alternating back and forth before we come back together uh, for a discussion as a whole class. So again, I'm kind of bouncing back and forth. And then finally we wrap up as a whole group. So I encourage you to come back and look at this um, and think about how you can place yourself in the schedule for, for a day's class so that your students are getting exactly what they need and know what to expect when during the class. So let's review. What are some in-class solutions you can use while you're there with your students? Encourage learner autonomy. Alternate between whole class, group instruction, and independent work. Collect samples of student work. So this is a way for you to be able to get some feedback from your students 
to do some informal assessment so that you can see what your students are doing when you're not able to be with them at every moment. Provide self-access materials for students who finish early. So I think in the chat box earlier somebody said some students get bored. So you might have a, a stack of, of copies of activities that they can go to or books that they can go to so that they're not sitting in their seat or you're not hearing students say, teacher, I'm done, finish. And then when you're with the students, with your, when you're with a group of students, give them the, your full attention. So give them everything you've got so that they feel like they have complete access to your expertise. And when they're working independently, they know that eventually you'll come back for pronunciation correction, grammar, comprehension questions to make sure they're getting what, what you're expecting them to and any vocabulary assistance they need. Outside of class, you're going to lesson plan, so make very careful plans and a, a schedule for yourself. Think about the objectives, not just finishing the book, but um, managing your plan in a, in a way that is both simple but also thorough. Find material. Think about what groupings will work for each of those materials. Adapt them if you need to. Provide differentiated feedback. So as you collect work from students, you might give them comments. You might make it simpler for the lower level students. You might make it more in-depth for the more advanced ones. And then finally, create a schedule to share. So I have a couple of case studies here that you guys can read later if you would like. Uh, one is um, a teacher named Michiko who has uh, different groups of students assigned to her. And the other is Jamila. She has all 11th graders, but they're all kind of advancing at a different pace. So when you have time, you can submit your ideas for these case studies advice for these teachers here on my Facebook page. It's ELS, English Language Fellow Kayla, on Facebook. And I'd love to hear what, what you guys have to say about these teachers. So the final poll is to ask you all what you think you will try based on the tips that you've heard today. So these are some of them. So which ones of these might you try? You can choose one or two or as many as you think you'll give, give a shot at. So encouraging learner autonomy, experimenting with grouping in different ways than you've been doing, differentiating instruction, or even doing some more research into differentiating instruction, trying new resources, so maybe News ELA or a uh, grammar or TED Talk. Um, and then providing students with a class schedule. So in the poll, will you guys go ahead and let us know which ones you think you might try after today? All right, the results. 59% uh, say encourage learner autonomy. 52% divide students in different ways. 24% say differentiate instruction, and 62% say try new resources. Okay, great. All right, so I think we do, Maggie, do we have a few minutes for questions? We have a few minutes, so we can take a couple questions. One question that came up straight from the beginning was about your opinion on the use of the L1 in the classroom if you think it's a problem for students to use Spanish, for example. Okay, so yeah, that's a really good question. Way back on the, the slide about scaffolding, the very la last uh, bullet point was use of the native language. So I usually tell teachers, um, go through all the, the tricks you have in the target language in English, and then if the students absolutely can't get it, if there's one word in Spanish or in their native language that you can give them that would just make it all better, then go ahead and do it. And the same thing happens with, uh, with students here. Sometimes they'll yell out a word in Spanish and I just nod or I shake my head no if, if they're 
write in their their question for me, but I'm not responding to them in Spanish. So as far as keeping them on English, because I think we had um, a question or we talked about the challenge of you know, students falling into their native language when they're working in groups, when they get bored. So I think good planning and having activities ready to keep the students busy in English is a good way to head that off. Also, if you're working in groups, it really lends itself, lends itself to competitions between the two groups. So you can have them kind of monitor each other for Spanish use and create a point system. So if you hear them speaking Spanish or whatever the, the native language is, they can tattle on each other and you know you can give a point to the team who heard the other point the other team speaking Spanish, something like that, where they create some accountability um, within the classroom to discourage the use of the, the first language. So English as much as possible, but when absolutely necessary, I think using the second language, the first language is is a good tool that we can take advantage of in uh, English as a foreign language environment. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, I think we have just about time for just about one. So Carlos has a question on how to develop students' proficiency who are very low. So those are the students I think that you'll have to, you know, be very careful about what you plan for them and spend lots of time with them. So uh, I was with a group this week who, it was a group of about 20 students and they were all very low level students and we put them into two large groups and the teacher said, how would I do that if in this case, I was with one group and she was with the other group. And she said, how would I do that if I were in the class on my own? And I said, in this group of very low level students, I still picked out two students who were a little bit higher level. So I would tap into the students that you recognize who have a little bit more English proficiency and see how they can help the other students. And they don't have to know that they are the helpers. But you can, you know, step away from a group where those those students are and work specifically with the ones who are really struggling. All right. So thank you, Kayla. It is after four, so I think we are about out of time for questions. If you have more, okay. you can send it to us through email. But thank you, Kayla, for your presentation. Got a lot of nice thank feedback you. from it. So we hope you enjoyed this presentation. There are many ways that you can connect with us if you would like to join us again or get more information about Relo Andes and different events and webinars that we have. First, you can find us on Facebook, that is Relo Andes, or on Twitter as well. If you have any questions or you would like to get on the mailing list to receive notifications of future events, you have the email there, reloandes at state.gov. Feel free to send us an email and we will get back to you as soon as possible. You can also respond to us through the confirmation email that you got when you registered. There, there is also a link for contacting us as well. So again, we hope you join us next month. That is Wednesday, June 28th. And thank you all. We'll see you again. Bye.